Uh, to multiple people, actually, because it was April 11th that I turned 15, so still getting used to it. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and what else? Oh, disclosures. She's not being paid to be here. No, uh, this I is wish voluntary. I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, she, does like to, she does like to advocate for mental illness. Yes. So as you know, some of you know, um, we have other uh, people in our family with mental illness. So she's been close for a long time, um, and she's an advocate, so it's a good thing. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, what I want you to do, for starters, is we're going to start talking about assessment data. So if you are going to assess someone, so you're working in a clinic or wherever you're working, and you're going to be assessing someone with an anxiety disorder, keeping in mind growth and development for someone who is 15 and not 30. Um, what are some of the areas that you're going to need to assess? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send her around and I'm just going to have her go from one table to the next. You guys can choose if you want someone to speak at your table or you can take turns, it doesn't matter. Um, asking different questions, you can all roll the data. So whatever her answers are, write down what you think is pertinent and I'll just send her around from one table to the next until we all feel like we have as much data as we want, okay? Um, before we jump into care plans. So wherever you want to start. All right, go for it. I'll start over here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> when were you diagnosed with anxiety? Uh, should I repeat the question? Yeah, we want to come to have her repeat the question so everybody can hear it. So, uh, when I was diagnosed with anxiety, let me think actually, that's a hard one. I don't know that much. Like nine? Eight. I think. Eight. I was eight. At eight, what were um, the situations that were stressing you out? Do you know, were there specific triggers? At yeah, um, at eight, some of the things that uh, triggered my anxiety a lot were like yelling, people yelling a lot used to do it a lot to me, mm -hmm. and um, movie theaters, sleepovers, just like dark places or yeah. loud places. What meds are you currently taking? Right now, I'm taking, do you have the list? <laughs> do you have the list? <laughs> what do you mean, do I have the list? <laughs> you know, do, you, do you know what medications you're taking? I know some of them. Okay, well, let's start with that. Okay. Talk to her okay, okay. <laughs> um, I'm taking Trileptol, Seroquel, Is that all I, I think that's all I can remember. I think have, for a second. What do you take in the morning? Adderall. Okay. Um, and I take Zyrtec too. But yeah, you do take allergies. Zyrtec. That's okay. Yeah. You just asked about meds. You didn't ask about other stuff. So that's okay. Right. So I have those four and then... One more. I'm so bad at this. Um, I can't remember. Four little white ones. Yeah, I know what oh. they look like. I can't think of what they look like. Loxetine. Loxetine, that's the other one I take. Uh, do you take Hold any? Hold on. I'm going to let her move forward to the next table. So you don't steal all the questions. <laughs> so you don't steal all the questions, exactly. But you can keep on that thread. You don't have to stop. I mean, you guys can keep on that thread if you like that thread. I'll go over here next. <laughs> Um, some of the symptoms I get with like panic attacks and stuff, usually it's hyperventilating a lot. Um, a lot of the time, if it gets really bad, uh, like crying a lot, just uh, very like racing and clouded thoughts. Um, shaking, I shake and I fidget a lot, like even when I'm 
not having a panic attack, I shake <laughs> just because. And I think those are the big ones. to have one of your triggers to get like one of your panic attacks or do you just like all of a sudden no one's coming to this? Um, I usually, it usually has to be a trigger. I haven't okay. had like a random panic attack since okay. I was really young. Um, you have usually my panic attacks, they can last anywhere from like three minutes to like an hour, depending on how quick I'm able to calm myself down. What do you use to calm yourself down? Uh, some of the things I use to calm myself down usually are like, uh, I have different breathing exercises that I've learned over the years and those usually work the best for me. Um, and just general distraction as well. And uh, I always need to get away from the thing that's making me anxious because Otherwise, I'll just keep going on and on no matter what I do. Do you have any sort of like relaxation exercises you do every day, you know, to kind of keep yourself calm or any sort of things that you do like that exercise, relaxation. Anything. I, um, like I write and I draw a lot, which helps me pretty much all the time. I remember, like, it wasn't even that long ago, it was like two weeks ago. I have a certain stylus that I use for drawing on my phone and I lost it mm -hmm. and I almost like, broke down because I couldn't find it and I was like so upset over that because it's like one of my really big coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Uh, my home environment is very calm, very positive. Um, I have a really good support system and really good people surrounding me at all times. Okay. When you have an episode um, and you're, let's say you're in class or something like that, what can you do to help calm yourself down? So I know sometimes you can't just go off and you know listen to music or whatever. Right. So what can you do then when you're in a, like, in a situation like that? Uh, usually I just have to rely on like breathing and some sort of distraction then like um, I don't know I can kind of zone myself out if I try and kind of you know be somewhere else and we had a thing set in place for a long time I used to get really bad panic attacks during school like in the middle of the day so bad that I couldn't keep going with school I had to go home in the middle of the day but um, we had a thing in place where when I got a panic attack with an IEP that I would be able to go down to the nurse's office and um, just sit in there and kind of calm down so that I wasn't surrounded by people because that's usually what brought it on is like big crowds of people. Did you find that to be pretty helpful then? Oh yeah, it was. It was. Okay. Um, what are some of like, have you noticed any side effects, any of the meds you're taking? Mm -hmm. um, one of my meds, I think it's my Seroquel, it makes me really, really tired, like all the time. And we recently cut it down to half the dose that it used to be because it makes me really tired. But uh, it's like, no matter what I do, I'm just extremely tired all the time. <laughs> what time of the day do you take your medications? Um, I take them when I wake up and right before I go to bed. Do you find that the Adderall might give you a little bit of anxiety in the morning? Uh, no, actually. I've had... To help with the racing thoughts, maybe? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just curious. <coughs> um, 
what is your diet? Um, not good. <laughs> I eat, I don't know, when I'm at home, I eat like a lot of like berries and stuff. Just like, I like fruit a lot, but when I can, I eat out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do actually. And then do they understand your situation? Like, do they understand when you are getting anxious or? I have um, certain friends that understand really well and certain friends that I just don't talk about it to because it's kind of a hard concept for some people to grasp, I know. So um, when there's things like, uh, I recently, um, the whole reason we had to move the date for this is because I went on vacation with a friend. <laughs> but. Um, I recently went and I have really bad anxiety with the roller coasters and stuff like that. I like cannot ride them. But she is super, super understanding and she's one of my like really good friends. And she actually got me to go on a few rides because she was really good at calming me down. Right. Um, are you good at making new friends or anything like that? Meeting new people, like doing this. Are you comfortable or <laughs> Um, it doesn't really make me anxious. I like talking, like, I like talking, I take after her, but I, <laughs> I especially like talking to like big groups of people and stuff, and this kind of thing, because it's like I'm educating a lot of people and it's really fun for me. Have you ever had to have the panic attacks of any kind of old hospital or anything like that, or a clinic or anything like that? No, I don't think so. And you say you have only serious adverse effects? No. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. So I see that you have corgis on your <laughs> Yeah. Do you have a service animal or like a pet at home that you find helps with your anxiety? My dog. I have a, um, he's a Labrador Great Pyrenees mix. Oh, how beautiful. And his name is Hank, and I love him more than anything. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, he can always calm me down. And he's not like a, we considered getting him like service animal training for a little while, but we never ended up actually doing it. But um, he's one of the things that like, no matter what, I can calm down when he's around. That's wonderful. <laughs> Anna, I wanna go back to the friend thing for a minute. Yeah. Um, because I think that that was a good thing that you could expound on what was going on friend-wise before this year. Oh yeah. Can talk some more about that? That was fun. There's more information about that. So from like around fourth grade to all the way up until this year, I had no friends like at all. Um, I was like completely unable to make friends at school and I had like, I went to a really small school. My whole class was seventh and eighth grade combined and it was seven people. It was really, really small. And um, the people there I just had a bad history with because Back before I had my medications, I acted out a lot and it got me a pretty bad reputation. So I um, hadn't had the greatest history with them and I just had no friends whatsoever. And then this year I ended up making a ton of friends. What kind of changed from that to now? Is it because you switched settings or you didn't see those people or did you get a new group of people? Yeah, um, they all went to Hall High School and I go to St. Beat Academy. So. I went to uh, a different school and met new people and stuff like that. And I learned from that time like how to interact with people better and how to be more natural in social settings and stuff. What is your sleep schedule? <clears throat> I sleep a lot. I sleep usually around like 12 hours a night, and then I nap in the daytime as well. Is it a restful sleep? Or do you feel <coughs> tired when you wake up? Um, usually it's enough for me to like get through the day, but I'm never really not tired nowadays. <laughs> I do, and I just recently switched to a new therapist. How often do you go to appointments with them? I started off going to her um, 
once a week, but as things got better, we spaced it out to every other week. Do you find that like helpful to see them and talk? Yes, I always I've had therapy since I was really young um, because I have a great support system and I was able to get in at a young age, and it's always been something that's super helpful to me. Do you have any other health issues? Uh, you said allergies. Allergies, yeah, I have allergies. I don't think anything big, no. No. <laughs> I don't get like a stage fright and stuff. I used to be a dancer, so I was up on stage a lot and stuff, and I kind of got used to being in front of lots of people. I don't know if anyone's asked this, but as far as your meds, when did you start all of these meds? Have you been on them for a while? Or? Some of them I started a few years ago, and some of them I started more recently. It's just been kind of switching between meds and figuring out what works for me and what doesn't and what has bad side effects and such. I can answer that more. The yeah. fluoxetine, she was eight when she started that. Um, mostly because she started her anxiety symptoms with panic attacks. Um, so her anxiety was fairly severe right from the word go. The physician that I took her to was very, um, what's the word? Um, She's not aggressive. I can't think of the word I'm Passive? Passive? She's no. Friendly? <laughs> <laughs> no. Receptive? Uh, what's that? Receptive? She's no, she's a, uh, but it, she's usually, she's not aggressive with meds is what I'm trying to get across. Mm -hmm. oh. um, conservative, there we go. Conservative. <laughs> um, but in her case, the panic was so bad that she felt like waiting would just delay the inevitable. Um, so we did that. We opted for the fluoxetine right away. And as you know, it's most researched and the one that we know the most about for kids. And that did work very well for her right from the top. I mean, at that point in time when she would be asked a question, she couldn't answer the physician. She would whisper her answer in her ear. She was so anxious she couldn't even talk out loud. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, and we also had used that physician with our other daughter for a long time, so we were real familiar with her. Um, and therapy, of course, right away. And so the fluoxetine was the only med for a long time. Um, we didn't add, it was a trileptal we added next, and she was probably 12-ish, maybe. That was a few good years down the road. Um, and then the Seroquel maybe around that time as well, because the anxiety was so bad, she couldn't sleep at night. She would be up, I don't know, my head's yep. talking to me all night long. It won't stop. And so the Seroquel, she actually started on 50, um, and then eventually was cut to 25 because of the date of sleepiness and then like she said just this last month cut to 12 and a half um, because the sleepy is so bad she doesn't take it she can't sleep with anxiety so yeah that still goes on to this day if I don't take my medicine I like I can stay up for like days I just like can't sleep at all no matter what question. do you want yeah, to have a lot of TV or anything before you go to bed um some days, it depends. I usually watch YouTube before I go to bed um, because there's certain videos that are like really calming to me. <laughs> I watch people like make stuff a lot, like things out of like resin and just little crafts and stuff because I don't know why it's really calming to watch before I go to bed. But <laughs> when I watch like actual TV before bed, it's like, you know, like horror movies and stuff because that's usually, it's pretty much the only thing I actually watch on TV. <laughs> um, what about exercise? Um, I exercise on and off. <laughs> we have an elliptical in our dining room, so I <laughs> get there. Yeah, I get there. It's a very good dust collector. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> I get to it when I can, but I forget a lot, and I also just got an Xbox, so <laughs> I've been forgetting a lot more. Do you have any other hobbies? Um, let me think. I do like a lot of different kinds of art. I do like just, you know, normal sketching, drawing, painting. And then I do calligraphy, uh, polymer clay, like sculptures and stuff, and um, digital art. And there's a few different things there. And then I spend most of my time either drawing or listening to music or both. And that's kind of it. 
I pretty I have the personality of a mashed potato. I say that quite often, but <laughs> mm -hmm. it's it's kind of you know. Have you ever thought that maybe your like racing thoughts and the way your brain works actually has helped you with creativity? And since you're into art and into those kind of things, maybe that is a, a good quality. Absolutely. You have about yeah, I have a lot of um, my best friend of like what, I think it's eight years now. She. I met her online forever ago, mm -hmm. and we just ended up like sticking together for so long. But she draws also, and she's an amazing artist. I could go on about her for days, but she um, does characters, and I never really did characters or people. I always did animals, mm -hmm. and uh, more recently, like in the past two years or so, she's gotten me into like making characters, and I've had so many like ideas about so many cool things to put on them and stuff, so that's helped. That's awesome. <laughs> How long more she lives? She lives in Hawaii right now. Oh, She's wow. moved around a lot because her mom's in the military, so. Well, how'd you meet her? We played an online game together when we were like seven. <laughs> and we ended up being in the same server together and we were just like, I don't know, we just had a good time and we just ended up staying in touch all this time. And eventually when we were like 10 or 11, we started Skyping. And then we just like kept in touch every single day. So they've never actually met face to face. No, sadly. Skyping. Sounds mm -hmm. like you need to take a trip to Hawaii. I know. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Question about your diet. You said you eat berries and you eat out. Can you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I um let's see, at home I'll eat very few things. I'm a really picky eater. That's one of the things. Um, I have food anxiety as well. I don't like my food to touch. If it touches, I won't eat it. Um, there's different things too, like uh, I get some of it from my dad. My dad has weird things, like if he can see the butter on something, he won't eat it. Like there's, there's just weird... Go back to you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but I, uh, yeah, so there's Things like that, but uh, mostly what I eat is like really simple things, hot dogs, like mac and cheese, stuff like that, and then uh, fruit. And then when I eat out, it's pretty much like chicken, mostly. Do you have like a lot of caffeine, like soda? Um, I drink, I didn't used to drink a lot of soda, and more recently I'm getting into it because uh, I started drinking Diet Dr. Pepper, and it's really good. So I've had, I've had a bit of that recently. But caffeine, caffeine's one of the things that doesn't affect me. It either doesn't affect me, or if I have a lot of it, it makes me sleepy. Oh. Are you involved in any like extracurriculars at school, or do you kind of stay away from those? I'm in <coughs> one club. <laughs> I'm in the tea club, which is great. We pretty much sit around and drink tea. Uh, like that's the whole club, and it's great. But like sports and stuff, I've never been a sporty person. I did track last year, and it was insufferable. <laughs> but. <laughs> Overall, uh, I'm not really in anything. I don't really do it like after school stuff. When was your last panic attack? It's hard. Hmm. Maybe November? down. There was a time back before I had new medicine where it would pretty much just be like any little trigger at all. I would get a panic attack. Like 
couldn't go to see movies, couldn't go to friends' house, couldn't, you know, do anything like that. But um, then, it, once I got my medicine, it calmed down a lot. And then there was a year in like seventh grade where I would get those panic attacks at school and have to come home halfway through the day, every single day. And then since then, it's been just fine. So it's kind of, kind of up and down. Yeah, at the beginning they were probably several times a week. <coughs> and I think part of that hard part was we didn't know what was gonna trigger it. Like she, she did have them at the movies, but she'd been to the movies. Yeah. So that was odd to us because we couldn't make the connection of why that was happening then versus it hadn't before, uh, which I think is often a, the case with panic, you know, and the normal activities that normally wouldn't bother suddenly does. So then you know, the parent, you're kind of stuck because you don't know what you should do or what you shouldn't do, and everywhere you go, you're worried about that, kind of like the person with the panic is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do you ever feel like you're sleeping too much? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, and even she tells me, I sleep all the time <clears throat> and nap all the time. Um, I've got, kind of gotten used to it. <laughs> like, it's not pleasant, but there's not really much I can do about it, so I kind of just like it. Eh. Would you say that there's a side effect from a medication that's causing yeah. you to sleep like that, but you would rather have that than the not sleeping at all? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, there's that double-edged sword. Yes. Because without awesome. the medication, all of the symptoms come back. <clears throat> And we, and we went through that in November. We went mm -hmm. through that, and actually, she was taking her medication. But we had a we had a, uh, a whole episode she can tell you about. And then, of course, with medication, we have constant drowsy, constant. You know, she's telling what she's saying is true. She will get up in the morning. She'll go to school because that's of course mandatory, right? School is mandatory. Mm -hmm. And then she comes home and she lays down, and she may sleep until ten o'clock at night. She doesn't get up to eat dinner. She doesn't usually eat what I make anyhow, but she would lay down. She'll get up at 10 o'clock at night. I'm hungry. Will you make me something to eat? And then she'll go back to bed. She can sleep all night. Yeah. In the morning. I mean, this is a, it's a problem, you know, because obviously homework, you know, things that have to be done, it's a constant tug of war to get that stuff done. But without the medication, you know, so, so there's always that find the lowest amount of medication that works for symptom control and not too much. And then you have side effects anyway. Right. You know, it's the lesser of two evils. Like, exactly. I'd rather be very sleepy than be constantly anxious. <clears throat> How has that affected like your weight? You know, have you lost, gained with all the, you know, all the sleepiness? I know you're not eating supper like she said, but. <laughs> yeah, I've had different effects over time. Um, I actually last year had this like, I don't know, this like random spur of motivation over the summer where I like ran a mile like every single day and I was like going, I was eating really healthy, I was on like a super low carb diet and I ended up losing 25 pounds, it was really nice, but um, I haven't gained any of that back through this. When I was on, uh, a little while ago I was on birth control and I was gaining so we ended up stopping that, but um, I haven't gained anything back and I actually have lost a little bit. Uh, because I've been more active, I've been trying to be more active, but I've lost a little more recently. Do you have um, more, ep do you notice more episodes like that have to do with your cycle, like menstrual cycle at all? Is that affected? I think it used to, but nowadays I don't really notice it. Do you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Uh, no. So, you mentioned that your last panic attack was in November, mm -hmm. and there was, you mentioned that something had happened in November. What happened? So, in November, I had, like, a really bad, just, like, um, spur-of-the-moment episode, and it was, like, for part of it, I stopped taking my meds, and I was extremely anxious all the time, and I got really, really depressed really badly, and um, a lot of stuff. I'm trying to think. That's, that's one of the things about the always sleepy is it also makes me have a very bad memory, so I have to kind of, like, retrace what happened then, because I remember that I did have a lot of issues, but I'm trying to think of 
more. You can remember more. That was mostly it. <coughs> yeah. She got really depressed. She had a oh, she yeah. had a depressive episode in November. That was most of the whole month of December. November, sorry. Yeah. And it took us all of December and all of January to then fix that. Yeah, to, to get back to baseline from that. Mm -hmm. Some of it in the beginning was not taking medications. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of spiraled after that because, of course, you know, once you stop taking those, the baseline goes away. Oh, yeah. And then when you get about a depression, when you get about a bad anxiety, it doesn't just recover <coughs> overnight. It's different for everybody. And in her case, it was really severe. Right. And that's the thing. Like, medicine is so important. You have, like, the, the amount of, like, even just the side effect of that kind of chemical imbalance dropping from having been like steady it, it gets even worse than before you had the medicine it like it will go absolutely crazy because it's just that like sudden drop that sudden like oh well this isn't happening anymore i'm not getting this anymore and your brain has no idea what to do with it and um that can get really really bad have you had suicidal ideations from that or the medicine or? Yes, just not from the medicine. Okay, okay. Just, just from yeah, just the depression from. And, and the anxiety, has that given you? Um, once. Once, okay. Have you ever acted on them? Um, not necessarily. I used to self-harm, but I never did it in a way that like, uh, it was an attempt. Like I never actually wanted to die enough to try it. It was more like a, like I deserve this type thing. Do you feel like you deserve it though? Um, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Why do you feel like you deserve it? Uh, a lot of the time, and it was like also with the fact that I had no friends then as well, I would just like, I don't know, I would make very little mistakes and I would weigh them so heavily on myself. And um, I was really sure at that time that I was gonna fail school and like fail everything and I would make them disappointed and stuff. And <coughs> because just like anybody else, right, when you become depressed, everything becomes a big job. Yes. The smallest <laughs> thing becomes a big job. So for someone her age, that's school. Right. Yeah, because school is your job. So then homework doesn't get done, and the grades rapidly fall. Right. So where everything was passing, now everything is failing. And with the mix of the depression and also the uh, like fatigue I get from my medicine and stuff, if I have a depressive episode while also taking that medicine, it becomes a chore to walk, to like physically get up. I have to like force myself, and it's like I remember I walked down the stairs like leisurely and I was like out of breath at the bottom because I was so just like I could not bring myself to actually do things and everything felt like something that was like a huge chore even if it was like going to get a glass of water like it was ridiculous. I'm going to add something to that because we talk about this and you've seen it in choices and you've seen it other places that when a person is severely depressed and they lose that ability to care for themselves and the hygiene kind of slides down the hill. And so we can be as educated as we want, we can know as much as we want and all of this. And honestly, a lot of what was happening to her, I completely missed the boat on. You know, because I'm busy doing my thing and she's doing her thing and she is getting up and going to school every day. And because she was a new freshman and come from a very small school going into a very big high school, I'm thinking, She's overwhelmed, it's overwhelming. Everybody's overwhelmed as a freshman, you know? And so a lot of what was going on with her, I'm just, this is where my brain is. Until she, I knew that she wasn't showering as much as she needed to, and you know, you can see her hair's really long. Yeah, this is big. She got lady. this gigantic knot back here. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's gotta go, I gotta get this thing out. So I sat her down and brushed this knot out, and it was insanely huge, and it took me hours, and I got very frustrated with her, and I'm combing this thing, and I was just screaming at her, I was like, what the hell you know why are you not washing your hair and she just burst into tears and she said i don't know and it took that for me to like hello light switch you know she doesn't know because she's so depressed she's not taking care of herself because she can't you know and and you know so that was like a moment like you know for me wake up you know your kid is in distress here there's things going on that you're not on top of 
So, you know, it can happen to the best of us that we think we know what's happening and we're really not quite there. So she needed a lot of good help and support. And that's another thing I want to talk about as well. I want you all to know, if you ever have a kid with anxiety, a friend with anxiety, and you make a mistake like that, do your best not to beat yourself up too much. Because it, like, there is so much going on, and it's so hard for the average person to understand. And like we get that, we understand that, and it's not a big deal if you make a mistake once or twice. Like everybody is going to. It's a very hard thing to understand and a very hard thing to like realize how you're supposed to work around that. So to maybe miss signs or to act up because you didn't know what was going on is not something that you should like demonize yourself for. Are there any times of the year where you find your anxiety or depression is worse? Um, I think <laughs> summer, my depression is usually worse. And around like fall time, my anxiety is usually worse. When you're feeling um, depressed and you feel like you have no energy and all those things like going up the stairs, what did you find to help you with that? Or if it ha happens to come up again, um, what what's your plan for that um, recently talking to her has been my plan because she like I said amazing support system she is like the sweetest and most understanding ever and she always gets me what I need like a therapist medication anything and so I usually whenever I'm depressed nowadays I always come to her first and then we can usually sit down and like calmly figure something out together what was the reasoning that you stopped taking your meds in November? I, hmm, I think I got really tired of being tired. <laughs> and it's the kind of thing that's like, when you're so sluggish and so tired all the time, there's a huge temptation to just say, screw it, and like, mm -hmm. just stop everything. So it's the side effects that yeah. you stop. And especially at that time, Finals were coming up, Christmas was coming up, I was super unstable, so there was like a huge urge, more than, much more than usual, because now, like I'm very stable right now, and like I know that it's ridiculous, and I would never ta stop taking my meds right now. Did you stop taking, when you stopped taking your medications, did you do that independently, or did your mom know that that was something that you wanted to do? I did that independently. She would have never let me. <laughs> and then my other question was, and maybe it was that I just didn't hear it. Was there a specific reason as to why you decided to stop taking them? Yes, uh, I was really fed up with the side effect of being tired. Okay. And so I was, and I was really unstable because of finals and stuff like that. It was a really stressful time. So I was like, I'm just gonna stop taking my medicine. So at that time, how we were doing medication was in the morning um, I would usually give it to her before she went to school only because I was usually getting up and wandering out the door before she was so I usually would make sure she was up getting ready and I would give her morning dose and at night she went to bed a lot of times after I did and she would take the pills herself and she was very good about it I never uh, most time never even had to remind her she usually just took them and uh, we do the pill box with the morning and the night so I would fill it for a week she would take them and it was never an issue um, which is part of how that got away on me because until a week went by and I saw that the pills were still in the box, sometimes I found them on the floor, you know, this is how I kind of came around to, oh my God, here, what's happening here? How are these not going where I thought? Yeah. So um, that's part of how that ended up happening, that they weren't being taken. Right. That's what I was wondering is how she hid it from. Or yeah. How hid it yeah. From. Yeah. Because, you know, and, I, and I, we've done lots of different things. So our oldest daughter took pills three times a day and we did the same thing with her pill box. When she got to that motivated point, she did them all herself. She even filled her box herself, you know. So, so we got to that, um, and so she at the same time got to that point herself. Took them herself. Didn't even have to remind her. Um, so then, when we hit these bumps in the road, you know, um, that's how that can happen, then, you know. And so that, and then we kind of went the whole other way back to the. Now I'm going to bring them to you twice a day, every day. I'm going to bring them to you and watch you put them in your mouth, mm -hmm. and not accept. Sometimes it would be, you know, but I'm not going to bed for another hour, so I'll take them before I go to bed. And even one time, that can be the next morning, they're still sitting there because whatever. You know, because I'm watching Netflix or I'm doing this or doing that. 
and I fell asleep and didn't take them or whatever. Yeah, yeah and there was, I'd do things like she'd bring the pills to me and I'd say like, okay, you know, I'd have them in my hand and I'd like shoo her out of my room and then I'd like put them in a jewelry box or something, mm -hmm. just like under clothes, anywhere that I could like get away with not taking them because I didn't want to take them that badly. And of course being in that mindset as well, like being in that completely emotionally and mentally unstable like place, you know, it's not like you have, you don't have that reason of like, this is like good for me, like this is what I need to do. So I just completely convinced myself that I was perfectly fine not taking my pills, which was not true. So at the time, were you seeing a therapist? Uh, yes, I was. And I was actually seeing a therapist that for the, a few months before I uh, switched to a new therapist, she really <coughs> wasn't helping because something she did a lot was um, she was she specialized in children and I started going to her when I was younger. Mm -hmm. But as I matured, she would start to, you know, she'd still treat me like a child. And there were times where she would really undermine things. Mm -hmm. Like I'd tell her something was going on and she would take it like I was exaggerating. And I was like, no, I really need help. Like this is actually right. happening. So um, at that time, I wasn't really getting any help from that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you're taking the triliptal for? That's because I, from what I've learned in class, it, uh, like for seizures, but also can be taken as a mood stabilizer, right? That's what but I. But do, do you have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or anything like that? Um, I've been told that I have a mood disorder. <laughs> Nothing specific, but um, I think, and a lot. I've also been told a lot of the time that they don't want to diagnose anything until you're older and stuff oh, like gotcha. that. So I, um, I've been told that I have a mood disorder and I also have, I know for a fact that I have like crazy mood swings sometimes um, if I don't take my medicine. But uh, yeah, so I take that to stabilize my mood and also I started taking it back when I had really bad anger issues mm -hmm. and it like completely stopped that. Okay. Yeah, when she was given that, that was more probably I would say the anger and that kind of stuff, outburst type stuff. Um, and there was a question about whether or not there really was some kind of a mood <coughs> disorder. So it was kind of like a trial. Give it to her, see if it helps any. Um, but she doesn't have an official diagnosis of any kind of mood disorder. When you quit taking your meds in November, did you quit all of them? Yes, I didn't take any of them. None of them. Is there a history of anxiety in your family? Yes, there is. A lot of my family members have pretty bad anxiety. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. Is there a history in your family um, with mood disorders? Is there? Well, what do you know about what Gianna has? Well, I know that, yeah, I know that Gianna... This is her sister. Her yeah, sister. my oldest sister. Um, like I've seen that evolve and grow and stuff. And so her oldest sister has bipolar disorder. Yes. Um, which I've seen <clears throat> obviously throughout my childhood, like watching the kind of stuff that happened there. I'm trying to think. Do we have anyone else in the family that has Sophia? Yeah. So Sophia has bipolar? She doesn't have bipolar disorder. Oh, so. yeah. See, my oldest sister before. has anxiety disorder. Yes, she has anxiety. Mm -hmm. And she has OCD as well, doesn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mm -hmm. so. So part of this, it's interesting just thinking from a historical perspective, when her oldest sister was, all of her symptoms were their worst, and we didn't even know what was going on. Um, that was around the time that she was between 12 and 15. They're 10 years apart. So yes. she was very young when all this was happening. So the middle sister and her were very young, and so there was all of this chaos in our house. You know, there was everything you can imagine. There was a lot of screaming and there was a lot of physical outbursts and there were police and there were ambulances and, and all the other things that go along with all of that. They were very young. And so there was a lot of, you know, the middle sister would take her and go to my bedroom and shut the door under the dining room table, you know, this sort of stuff. So a lot of the theories that we've been told anyway from, from our healthcare providers is that some of their anxiety could have rooted from that. 
um, because we know that early childhood trauma can cause that kind of stuff. Um, and early on when I took her, one of the things that we were told was that there was potentially some PTSD for her um, because she was three and four years old when a lot of this stuff was going on. Um, and then her sister was away from home for a year and a half um, during the time that we were getting her stabilized, getting her treatment. Um, and so um, it was a lot of years of up and down. It was a lot of years of nothing being stable in the household um, during that time. And then her dad has um, some social phobia as well. So yes. uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of anxiety in our family. Oh yeah. And my, uh, my male sister, Sophia, as well, she is just like me in the fact that nowadays we like cannot hear people yell. Like if people yell, we will like, it's a, like an instant trigger for both of us because of all that that happened, you know? And um, like, no matter what, we both like hide away when it happens too. Cause uh, I have friends who have parents who argue and stuff and every time it happens, I'm like, I gotta go. <laughs> like I can't, I can't stay here. Do you still live with all your sisters? Uh, no, Sophia has her own house and so does Gianna. Do you think that helped, um, like, or did it make it worse or better whenever your sisters were around? If they were having episodes as well, was that a trigger for you? Um, yeah, actually, and that was one of the things, <clears throat> one of the reasons that I knew that I was afraid of, like, riding stuff, because my sister Sophia used to get really bad panic attacks on rides, and I remember being like, I. We went, we were going to Disney World. I couldn't have been more than like five, six years old. Yeah. And um, my parents wanted to go into this like, it wasn't even like a ride, it was like a theater thing. But my sister Sophia had a panic attack and they wanted to take me in and I was like, ah. I was like, look at her, I'm not going in there. I have a question, but I don't know if it pertains. As a mother, how have you learned to cope with this? been a long road. <laughs> yeah, because so like, you know, like my younger brother, he they wanted to diagnose with bipolar as a child, and we said absolutely not. I mean, how there at the time there wasn't even research there. Mm -hmm. In coming forward, what his problem was is he had very severe ADHD. Mm -hmm. So his mind processed so fast that even even as a seventh grader, mm -hmm. they integrated him into college chess, mm -hmm. and his courses were even taken at a college level because his outbursts would be proving his teacher is wrong. Mm -hmm not trying to be insulted, mm -hmm. but because he knew his answers were right. Mm -hmm. So I've seen how my mom has coped mm -hmm. with it, like she's had various friends who, you know, you kind of say like, is your child like mm -hmm. this too, you know? But did you ever have like a therapist or like I an did. external We network? were the poster child for therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of this started with our oldest. We were in individual counseling. We were in couples counseling, we were in family counseling, and all my kids went to counseling. We were in therapy more than we were home, more than we were anywhere. And I, I'm a big advocate for that because I don't think there's a person alive that can't benefit from some kind Absolutely. of story. Honestly, I do. But I also think that we were overwhelmed with it. I mean, I didn't know anybody who dealt with anything that I was dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, I got called everything from a bad parent to a lazy parent to you name it, you know, um, to the point where it was just very isolating. We just kind of closed ourselves off. Even our parents, you know, they didn't they didn't know what was going on. They had right. no clue. Um, we were fortunate in that our oldest daughter was very close to our mother-in-law. So when my brain was going to explode from everything, she would go there. I would send her there and she would stay there sometimes for a month at a time, um, which gave us kind of a respite. My parents had no clue, did not understand at all. And in fact, that was kind of damaging because they were very close to her when she was very young. And after this happened, the relationship is just broken. It's just broken. They still don't really know how to interact with her. They can't, right. and she's much better, but they don't know how to do that. Right. So it's, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, it is what it is. But it was very difficult, very difficult for us to, you know, I, I know a lot more now. Let's oh, put it that way. You know, just like I, I use this as an example in here that, you know, I was never interested in mental health, never wanted to deal with mentally ill people, and never planned to, never thought I would. And certainly still I'm not interested in mental health nursing from that side of my professional life, uh, but I see the need much more now. So then if you were to then, like being in the career now as a professional, if you were to see a family member going through that, would you then recommend either like family counseling, individual counseling for the child, or that they're of um, like a spousal therapist? Absolutely. 
-hmm. Absolutely. Because you know, it's like anything else. I mean, we'll tell, and, and when you get to your domestic violence thing next week, you know, you'll hear them say how even if you can't get the person to go that needs it the most, even if you go, it helps you cope with the situation, mm -hmm. you know? So my husband had a really, really rough time with all of this. He didn't understand it. Sometimes he still struggles to understand mm -hmm. what's all happening. Um, so there were times when, when he wouldn't go, or you know, he would go, then he wouldn't go. But just me going was helpful because it helped me cope with everybody else. Right. Well, all their stuff, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I just like to make a statement? When I went to Choices, I thought there was something that was discussed in group. I thought it was really important when it comes to mental health that everyone deals with stressors in their life. Mm -hmm. Like everyone does. And some may have more than others, but what really matters is how you cope and deal with these things. And when it gets to the point where it's taking over your entire life, then you know you need to figure out something maybe that's more healthier way of dealing with these issues. And like, let's say, one thing may trigger her and freak her out, may do nothing to me. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the individual. It's not really, you can't control what's happening on the outside of your life, but you can't control what you do. Mm -hmm. So I think that was something that I thought was really, uh, cool thing, and then yeah. write about it. So definitely, definitely, and and it's hard when it's your kid, because your kids are your life, and so it's hard for it not to take over your life. Mm -hmm. I agree 100% with what you're saying, mm -hmm. and even now people will remind me. Different people will say to me, you know, you have to not let it be your whole life. You know, when something's going on with her or one of her. Sometimes I don't hear from my oldest daughter very much, and then when I do, it's a, a phone call, and I know immediately, because the minute I say hello, what I hear on the other end is, ha, ha, you know, and it's crying, and I'm like, okay, you know, and I'm, mentally I have to get my mind into this mode of what's happening, and how much do I need to do, and when can I step back, because this can then be, our life is gonna be chaos for the next however long it is, mm -hmm. whatever the crisis currently is. So, you know, yeah, I mean, it's true, you can, your whole life can be, wrapped up in it um, because it because it's your kid and it's not your friend you can't walk away from it you right. know when it's depending on the person but when it's your family it's a little different you know um, very good question so let's see um, I will prompt someone no one's asked anything yet about substance abuse or substance use <clears throat> Do you abuse substance abuse? <laughs> 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 um, let me think um, no. <laughs> I have friends who do, and I've never really gotten into it. Have you been offered that? Oh yeah, a lot. <laughs> Tons. There's like, you know, you go to places and there's like the coke deal in the gym. Like there's, you know, it's high school. <laughs> this is how bad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, someone, yeah, a guy asked me to ask to buy my Adderall, which was what? pretty fun. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, it was an interesting experience. It was like, are you out of your freaking mind? <laughs> <laughs> it like, I don't know, everybody around me, like in my school, I have very few friends who aren't like extremely addicted. <laughs> so I- Nicotine, we're talking about nicotine. Nicotine, yeah. and, well, other things too. But like, um, <laughs> you know. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I want to tell her about this. <laughs> but, um, I like I've been offered it and stuff, and I've really never been tempted to try it. My dad has like pounded it into me that drugs are bad. I'm like, okay, okay. So I, uh, my dad used to smoke as well, so he told me all about that, like what it was like and why I shouldn't do it, and this and that. And he's always been really good at like life lessons and stuff. But um, even with like, you know, like vaping and jeweling and stuff, there's just no desire, no appeal to me. That's good. I might have a bad side effects with your medication. Oh yeah, actually. <laughs> How did you handle the situation when someone wanted to buy um, your prescription meds? Uh, I Was laughed it? really hard <laughs> at first. And, um, he was like, no, 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 I'm serious. I was like, that's not happening. I was like, are you crazy? It was this one guy <laughs> that I'm actually quite good friends with. He's just insane. But um, he was talking about it and he was like, no, no, I just wanna like try one. He was like, I don't wanna get addicted or anything. I was like, no, like what's wrong with you? And he was like offering me tons of money and stuff. And I was like, this is 
how, how do you ever think this is okay? How do you ever think this is okay? Apparently it's a thing though. And I try to, oh, yeah. we try as much as we can to give her solid outs. Like, you know, you could tell somebody, hey, you know what, my mom counts those. So if yeah. I were to, you know, an extra one goes missing, there's going to be questioning, you know, or something like that, you know, because, I mean, it, it does happen. It's pretty common that people buy each other's Adderall, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of, like, I don't know. Back, obviously, I said I went to a really small school. There was, like, nothing in the way of, like, drugs or anything there because it was small and everyone was really, you know, like, uh, sheltered. So I never ever knew anyone that smoked or did anything like that. And people were like, <laughs> you were like shunned if you had like um, a sip of alcohol there. Like it was, it was a big thing. But um, so going from that to an environment where like everybody smokes was like really shocking. Cause, and, and I told my friends about it and they were like, yeah, like that's just how it is. And I was like, well, I had no idea that's how it is. <laughs> like, it was a, a big thing to me because it was such a big switch. And I was like, wait, like, this is happening? Like, this is how people are? Okay. But yeah, high school has, has <clears throat> opened me up to a lot of things that people do that I didn't know actually happened. Kudos to you because I made mistakes when I was younger. And I mean, when you're a teenager, she's only 15. <laughs> exactly. When you're 15, you're very impulsive a lot of the times, and you want to. And having friends is really important at that age. So you want to fit in. You and at that time, there's a lot of peer pressure going on. There so, is. You know, the fact that you feel like you don't have to do that, I think, is is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and like I said earlier about, you know, you can't control what other people do, but you can't control what mm -hmm. you do. So right. when they're like, hey, come on, let's just do whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You don't We're hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> two out, one go. So you just don't, <laughs> don't know what it's going to be. And I have I have two friends I know for sure would like throw me into the sun if they knew I really didn't like that. <laughs> I have my friend from Hawaii, and I have a friend at school named Abby, and they are both like, super protective and they're both like if you ever did anything like that I would kill you like <laughs> so it's I've got really really positive and really healthy people around me okay I want to get back to this one one more thing and then we'll go ahead with the care plans we'll do that next um, there was one thing we didn't talk about Anna you didn't mention it but I would like to bring it up because it does happen with anxiety so remember when you learned about anxiety disorders in your book you learned about some physical things that people can do when they're anxious if you remember things like hair pulling Mm -hmm. um, ticks, excoriation disorders, stuff like that, which you suffer from one of those. Do you want to yes. talk about that briefly? Uh, it's not super noticeable right now. I have little dots all over the back of my hands. Um, like, some of them are red, some of them are Why don't are you walk around scars. so that you can get a little bit of a closer yeah. look at what you're talking about? And it's um, part of my... You're going to have to get closer because I can't see it. Okay. It's like part of my disorder is that I will, like, poke at my hands with a pencil um, whenever I'm really anxious. And I have a lot of these little scars all over my hands from it. And um, it's a big thing because of school and stuff. Um, because when I'm at school, obviously, I have like the means to do it. So whenever I'm at school, uh, if I get really anxious, I'll do it. And it's like um, I've thought, I was like positive that it was like a thing with my skin. I was like, no, 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 I'm telling you, it's not my anxiety, there's something wrong with my skin, I'm, I'm sure of it. But it's like, uh, it's kind of weird because it's like a delusion almost. Like I was positive that there was actually something wrong with my skin, but there isn't. It's just the fact that I get really anxious and it's like one of the things I just do for some reason. But it is- Skin was, picking. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know, it's the kind of thing that I was like, we have to get to a dermatologist, we have to get to a doctor. And we did, and they were like, there's nothing wrong with you, like, I don't know why you're here. But, yeah, we thought it was eczema, we thought it was all kinds of stuff, but it just wasn't anything at all. So one of the ways that I can tell that her anxiety is starting to go up is I will see more scabs yes. and marks on her hands and sometimes on her feet. Yeah. And so that kind of is a trigger to me that, okay, things are not as good as they could be. Yeah, and I used to be in karate classes, and 
you know, we wouldn't wear shoes in there, so I would have the marks on my hands and my feet, and I remember some kid asked what it was, and I was like, uh, hand, foot, and mouth, like, you know. I just, <laughs> just making up an excuse. And I came in, and the next few weeks, he was, he was like, hand, foot, and mouth doesn't last that long. I was like, shut up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. And that's been problematic as well, because other kids in school. Oh, yeah. Would think that's, she had oh. something, you know, how kids are. Kids can be bratty, and, you know, mm -hmm. what do you got? What's wrong with you? Kind of. I see people in high school are a lot less like that, weirdly enough. I thought they would be a lot weirder about it, but it was really mostly middle school. I had um, my friend Abby ask me about two days ago, why are you doing the hand thing again? And um, I like explained it to her and stuff, um, which was interesting. She's really understanding, so it wasn't like a bother to me. But it's, it's the thing like, um, if I'm working in groups or working with partners, I try really hard not to do it because it's like, it's obvious. So it's the kind of thing that it's like, it's hard to explain to people because they're like, well, why are you messing with your hands if there's nothing actually wrong with your hands? And it's like, well, I've got anxiety. Like, well, that just means you're nervous, right? It's like, no, there's so much more to it. And that's another thing. Ah, yes, the you're just nervous thing. Like, just calm down. Hate that. That's. <laughs> So not correct when people, when I say anxiety and people think scared, like people just think nervous, like they think of it as an emotion rather than a disorder, which is really hard to deal with because then it's like, how am I supposed to explain this to you? Like you're not, you're never going to get it until you mature a little bit and kind of really think about it. So sometimes teachers are an issue there too. Oh yeah. Because teachers, if teachers are not educated and they don't understand and I would get, I would get this in my feedback. She's always looking at her hands. She's always picking at her hands. And they couldn't put the two and two together. There's a disorder and there's a reason she's doing that. She's not doing it to not listen to you. Right. She's doing it because she cannot help it. And so sometimes people need a lot of education. So I'm gonna stop you there so you guys can do your care plan. Okay. I'm gonna turn this off.